Like, comment, subscribe is the mantra of every YouTuber. But as YouTube's algorithms, plural, have continued to learn, as Google likes to say, they might need to update that with a new mantra. Obey, conform, bell scribe, and consume. Bon holocal, mes amours. I know it's been a while since you've seen me, and while some of that is certainly my own doing, as I'll be talking about towards the end of this video, some of the blame falls squarely on YouTube and the manner by which they've been training their user base, creators and viewers alike, to operate within the increasingly strict interests of their algorithms. It's as if there are only two types of people nowadays, the people who control the bots and the people who are controlled by the bots. It hasn't always been like this. I remember a YouTube long since past where you could find new and interesting people and content without even the slightest interference. You could take part in conversations and genuinely engage with people you agreed with or starkly disagreed with. And with just a webcam and passion, you could truly, as the tagline says, express yourself. But whether you're a content creator or a viewer on YouTube, those days are all but gone unless you're willing to run on an ever-accelerating treadmill YouTube has put beneath you. So in this video, we're going to spend some time discussing the ever-accelerating treadmill that is YouTube and the influence it has had on content creators and viewers alike. Very often, when you hear about the systems that run behind the scenes at YouTube, you hear the phrase YouTube algorithm. But I think this often leads people to envision a single monolithic bot, which manages every video from its monetization to its placement on the front page, recommended section, subscription pages, and everywhere else. But that will be underestimating the developers at Google and YouTube. Instead, when you think about the systems behind YouTube, it's better to think in terms of multiple algorithms multiple related but separate machine learning produced bots, which serve a very specific goal for the site. Now, machine learning is a very complicated and involved subject that is far beyond the scope of this video. But if you'd like a peek into how these algorithms are made, I'd recommend watching CGP Gray's How Machines Learn. And I'll include a small segment of his video here just to give a bit of context. Say you want a bot that can recognize what is in a picture. Is it a B or is it a 3? It's easy for humans, even little humans, but it's impossible to just tell a bot in bot language how to do it, because really we just know that's a B and that's a 3. We can say in words what makes them different, but bots don't understand words, and it's the wiring in our brains that makes it happen anyway. While an individual neuron may be understood and clusters of neurons general purpose vaguely grasped, the whole is beyond. Nonetheless, it works. So to get a bot that can do this sorting, you don't build it yourself. You build a bot that builds bots and a bot that teaches bots. These bots' brains are simpler, something a smart human programmer can make. The builder bot builds bots, though it's not very good at it. At first, it connects the wires and modules in the bot brains almost at random. This leads to some very special student bots sent to TeacherBot to teach. Of course, TeacherBot can't tell a B from a 3 either. If the human could build TeacherBot to do that, well then, problem solved. Instead, the human gives TeacherBot a bunch of B photos and 3 photos and an answer key to which is what. TeacherBot can't teach, but TeacherBot can test. The adorable student bots stick out their tongues, try very hard, but they are bad at what they do. Very, very bad. And it's not their fault, really. They were built that way. Grades in hand, the student bots take a march of shame back to BuilderBot. Those that did best are put to one side, the others recycled. BuilderBot still isn't good at building bots, but now it takes those left and makes copies with changes and new combinations. Back to school they go. TeacherBot teaches, er, tests again, and BuilderBot builds again. And again, and again. Now, a builder that builds at random and a teacher that doesn't teach just tests and students who can't learn, they just are what they are, in theory shouldn't work, but in practice it does. Partly because in every iteration, BuilderBot's slaughterhouse keeps the best and discards the rest, and partly because TeacherBot isn't overseeing an old-timey one-room schoolhouse with a dozen students, but an infinite warehouse with thousands of students. Now, the funny thing about these bots, these algorithms, is that just because they're able to arrive at the correct answer after enough growth and learning, as it's called, the road they take to get there can be very, very suboptimal. 
a machine learning algorithm tasked to determine how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers to arrive at the number 4, could very well completely skip over 2 plus 2 and arrive at its answer by subtracting 10 from 2, giving it negative 8, and then adding the square root of 144 to negative 8 to arrive at the correct solution of 4 and algorithms generated by the so-called builder bots will retain this manner of going around their elbow to get to their asshole for generations and generations to come. Scale this up to tasks such as determining which 16 videos to put into the recommended section of YouTube's front page, or determining whether a video is advertiser-friendly or not, and the complexity of these algorithms grows to unimaginable extremes. Taking whatever random, possibly suboptimal algorithm has been passing the tests provided by the teacher. You might be saying to yourself, at least it's arriving at the right solution. But who determines what the right solution is for a problem as complex as determining whether a video is advertiser friendly or front page friendly or should be put into the subscription page though? What happens when the conscious or unconscious biases of the person are introduced into the teacher bot's answer key? What happens when multiple bots, each tasked with different, very specific jobs, have each inherited generations upon generations of elbow-to-asshole algorithms and teacher-influenced biases? See a video about a controversial subject, such as Syria, or gun control, or even Caitlyn Jenner. Well, I think those of us who have been with YouTube as viewers or content creators, have a pretty good idea of what happens at this point. And I think Philip DeFranco sums it up quite nicely. Unfortunately, we're being hit by what I would call a, a sister algorithm. Often when you see YouTube comments about demonetization, they, they often separate it from suppression of views. And it's accurate, but also at the same time, very misleading. Technically, demonetization and the rating of a video, let's say, as mature, where it's unable to be on trending, on the front page, watch next, the recommended tab. Think of those as separate, but very, very similar levers. While a video being demonetized does not 100% of the time mean that that video will be suppressed. Now when we see that little dollar sign, it's kind of like a canary in a coal mine. Unfortunately, because YouTube is not transparent with how they rate our videos or why or what is in that video, you don't know for sure, but it's usually reflected in the views and at the rate of the views. The levers which Philly D is referring to are these algorithms, these bots, which have evolved over generations and generations of refinement by the bot that builds them and the bot that tests them. And while from YouTube's perspective, they appear to be getting better and better at their jobs, from the point of view of many content creators and the audiences which love them so much, they're failing miserably. A video with even the word gun in the title will get no engagement or promotion even to those who have subscribed or bellscribed. But as shown by a simple example run by Tim Pool, merely changing the title to put hyphens between the letters in gun can remove the suppression on a video. But this is merely a workaround, a workaround that works best for larger content creators. And because these content creators already have a massive audience going out of their way to be sure they haven't been unsubscribed by one of YouTube's algorithms, to check the creator's page for updates instead of checking the subscription feed, etc., they have means by which to fight back against these algorithms, to provide analytical data which the teacher bot can use to improve its testing of algorithms. This isn't the case for smaller content creators, and it most certainly isn't the case for viewers. Recently, YouTube's Creator Insider channel made a video which caused a lot of controversy after they revealed that subscribing to a person doesn't actually mean you're subscribed, and even bellscribing doesn't mean you will actually get notifications. Instead, there is an algorithm whose job is to analyze your viewing behavior and break down your viewing habits in order to determine which videos it should notify you about, which videos it should just put in your subscription feed, and which videos to leave out entirely. Um, YouTube, do you notify all of my subscribers every single time I go live? We don't notify all of your subscribers, right? We notify all of your subscribers who have rung the bell and then your most active subscribers after that. Okay, so we try to notify um, the people who we believe would be most likely to tune in and watch your content. That's right. While it's live. That's right. While not necessarily overwhelming and spamming um, all of your subscribers with these, these notifications. That's right. Philip DeFranco was concerned by this and reached out to YouTube and learned that this not only applies to live streaming, but to uploading videos as well. 
which led to Creator Insider having to publish another video, clarifying the difference between notifications and the subscription feed. But this only led to further backlash against YouTube. Before the adpocalypse and the PewDiePie Wall Street Journal fiasco, when you subscribed to a person, every time that person uploaded a video, it would be placed in your subscription feed to find. This changed when they created the bell, and has changed more and more with time, and a lot of people see this in the same light that they see a recurring bug, in which people are unsubscribed from content creators they really love, but weren't able to watch for a few days or a few weeks due to circumstances within their lives. While subscriptions and notifications are handled by at least two different bots, they both seem to have learned something that doesn't quite meet users' expectations and these users are unable to find videos by their favorite content creators without going directly to the creator's page, unless the viewer schedules themselves around that content creator and engages actively with that content creator. And much like the ever-accelerating treadmill these content creators find themselves running upon, having to publish videos daily, having to change how they behave and present themselves, having to modify their language or scripts, and having to more and more manage their channels in a very hands-on manner just to assure they're able to see everyone's comments and engagements. The viewers have also been placed on a treadmill. You have to catch your favorite content creators live. You have to like, comment, subscribe, and bell scribe. You have to engage on a level that might not even be feasible just to be sure you've remained subscribed and receiving notifications from that channel. Not only does the content creator have to make a full-time job out of their social or passion project just to be seen, their audience must also make a full-time job out of engaging with the channel's content in order to continue seeing that content. This is where we've gone past the Rubicon of automating and providing content from creators to the viewers which would want to see it, into the realm of actively punishing both creators and viewers, and the effects have been swift, dramatic, and very obvious. Philip DeFranco and Boogie2988 have produced videos talking about contingency plans in order to maintain the businesses they've created. Sargon of Akkad and others have held streams discussing the dangers of the direction YouTube is taking, and across the site, all but the most uncontroversial, advertiser-friendly videos have seen enormous drops in their view counts, per video and per hour. And likewise, viewers are confused as to why important videos on subjects like Syria, or even the YouTube algorithms themselves, have been all but invisible to them. Many have slated this as the beginning of the end for YouTube, but I have a different perspective on the matter. If I'm being completely honest, it's been quite a struggle for me to even bring myself to create videos of recent. A word that has been used by many people, including Philly D and Sargon of Akkad, is disincentivized. But with me, specifically, it's been outright demoralization. This, mixed with health problems and the need to take any contract job I can, no matter how small, just to make ends meet each month, has made it extremely difficult to even pop open Sony Vegas to make memes and shit posts. Because I know they won't be seen, I know they won't garner engagement, and while some might think I'm on YouTube for the money, YouTube was something very different from me as far back as the beginning. When I had started my career, as it might be called, on YouTube back in 2015, I had already lost everything. I was just recovering from chemotherapy, living in a housing facility for medically critical homeless people in Seattle, when I created my first videos. And at that time, I had no one else in the world but my dog to talk to. And I wanted to talk about things that no one else seemed to even want to discuss. I remember rather fondly my first time on the Honey Badger radio show, being told by Karen Strawn that not even she would touch the subject of male homelessness. But I muscled through and spoke my piece on the subject. I was getting onto streams with other people, I was building a new social life from the ashes of my previous life, and the environment I had found myself in. I began branching out into different, equally difficult and controversial subjects, and YouTube became something for me I just couldn't find offline. A means to communicate with people. A lot of people. I've never made it big with YouTube, at best reaching 1,500 subscribers, and my best video only ever reaching about 10,000 views. But that was a lot of people, and it gave me new options, new venues to pursue a better life. It gave me friends and family at a time which I had neither, some of whom have stayed with me from that time, and each of you know who you are. I thank you all so very much. If it wasn't for you all, I don't know what I'd be doing right now. 
I might have ended up living under a bridge again, honestly. But here's the thing about people like Philip DeFranco and others looking to leave YouTube. It won't actually hurt YouTube's bottom line. Earlier, we spoke about YouTube's algorithms being taught with an inherent bias and using terribly suboptimal algorithms that merely pass the test. But I don't think political or controversial topics are quite what they're biased against. While this kind of content might score low based on the interactions of multiple algorithms, determining the content to be for mature audiences or unmonetizable, the greatest bias YouTube's algorithms show is toward the profitability for YouTube itself, whether in regards to advertising revenue for YouTube's sister company AdWords, or in regards to the passive analytics data collected by YouTube to fuel AdWords and Google Search in order to inform advertisers how and where they should place their ads. Now, I know what you might say, but Sevi, YouTube isn't profitable. We've known this for years. And to this, I'd have to respond, no. We only knew that for the period of time around the first adpocalypse, We've had no public information with regards to revenue since then that I'm able to find. And even if YouTube itself isn't profitable, it, like the Android platform for mobile phones, is a primary medium for Google to serve advertisements to you. And advertising is where the majority of Google's profits come from at this time. YouTube might not be self-sufficient, but YouTube and AdWords together are a powerhouse and AdWords would be far weaker and far less profitable without YouTube. And it is the profitability of advertisements on YouTube, even post adpocalypse, which have brought us to where we are today. YouTube's algorithms are working exactly as intended, if perhaps in strange and sometimes impossible to understand ways. But the intention is not primarily to serve you the content you want to see. No, first and foremost, YouTube's algorithms work to serve you exactly the advertisements AdWords wants you to see, in a manner that profits Google above all else. Those of us who have been with YouTube as viewers and content creators are merely here to serve this giant analytical engine and assure advertisements have a video on which they can be placed and eyes which will see the advertisements and everything else is just a memory of a YouTube long since gone. The only way to succeed is to conform one's content creation and content consumption to an ever-growing list of demands by YouTube's algorithms. And even then, even if you do everything right, one elbow to asshole algorithm could drop your views by 50 to 90%, all because you're not going to profit Google enough. So what comes next? Some people are leaving the platform, having been disincentivized to use the platform due to the ever-accelerating treadmill of content creation and consumption. But this won't be the end of YouTube. No, the algorithms are working exactly as intended, and as soon as one of us leaves, whether as a consumer or a creator of content, the system will replace us with someone who is more in line with advertiser interests, more in line with Google's political and social interests, less controversial, more profitable, and before long, YouTube will just be broadcast television 2.0 dominated by the influencers it deems most worth your time and the legacy mainstream media outlets which will replace the more controversial alt media news channels that choose to leave and everything else will just be sanitized fortnite let's players or whatever game is the new hotness for that month today we're going to be going over five fortnite youtubers who've sworn 